Hey, it's Dave Bauer. And this is Brian Mertens, and you're listening to Rewilding Conversations. Hey, Dave. Hey, here's my buddy Brian. How are you? Uh, good. Good. It's a nice sunny day here in Nova Scotia. I was just outside harvesting some garlic scapes and, uh, yeah, ready to hang out with you for a little bit. Yeah, well, so we have, thank you. I'm willing to do the same. Very excited about some of the questions that we've shared prior to our um, conversation, which always kind of enticed me to think deeply. Um, we had a really remarkable event here yesterday uh, between 9 and 9.30. As, as climate becomes more energetic and we get more kind of unusual aberrant episodes, we had hailstones here in Buffalo, New York that were, oh, I don't know, moderately sized, certainly not golf ball sized or anything like that. And it, it really came down very hard for about 20 minutes. And so when my wife and I went out later yesterday and then again today, we saw that a number of species of plants uh, weren't up to the beating. So some of the lettuce, oh. <clears throat> some of the uh, begonias, some of the uh, flowers and vegetables look like uh, somebody beat them up. Uh, so I'm sure they'll come back, but uh, it was quite a unique episode. The flower beds um, that we have on our property and the neighbor's property had this white material that reminded us of of, of, of winter because it was the it was the residual hail that was left. So now this doesn't build the image for Buffalo, New York. You know, you mentioned Buffalo, New York, and people say, "Oh my God, you live in, in a blizzard." But no, we don't. We live in actually a wonderful climate. We just had a really bizarre moment. So that's my unusual tidbit for the beginning of this call. Yeah. Cool. That's uh, that's funny. It's always um, interesting summer weather in those sorts of areas where you, you get the the hot days, but then you can get mm -hmm. like really bizarre weather. I rem I used to live in London, Ontario, and. Um, I remember we used to get storms in, in summertime where you'd go outside and the the sky would sort of turn this pale green color and you'd look up and you'd see the clouds like kind of spinning around and um just big thunderstorms and we don't really we don't really get that kind of weather out here in Nova Scotia but we, we get hurricanes and stuff, so yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the 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 joys of the summer and the joys of uh, warmer, warmer moments, which here in Buffalo we we really cherish. So, so I've got a few. Um, let's 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 pose our questions to so see if I've got this right. I think we're curious today about how to observe uh, our students or your students for those listening in, the students they have, and 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 how to help them grow. So, uh, uh, I guess I'm kind of wondering and certainly jump in, but I, if you're willing to let me take the, the lead, I reviewed some novel thoughts and I wanted to see what your spin was on them related to some information you shared. So are you good with letting me be the uh, questioner for a moment and question you on one or two items? Yeah, definitely. I'll just um, just say quickly before we get into that, sure. um, just that, yeah, yeah we, we wanted to talk today about using observation as one of these mentoring tools where when you go yeah. outside and you're wanting to connect people with nature, one of the yeah. things that's really helpful is to actually not only have your own senses open to what nature is offering, but also to have your senses open to what the people around you are actually offering in terms of like what's getting them excited, what are they wanting to learn, and, and just using different things. If you can sort of notice when people are particularly engaged um, in nature as a natural thing, then you can, you can start where they are. And it's, it's just a much easier way of, of getting people to a, a deeper space in their connection with nature. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the topic for today. And I'll, I'll, uh, mm -hmm. I'll let you take the reins. Well, for a bit, for a bit, we, as we always do, we pass it back and forth. So I was excited because uh, I have some questions. So, so one of the things you and I have talked about is reminding ourselves as we head outdoors 
in some shared time with one person, one other person, or a small group of people, to let the others lead with curiosity. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious in some ways what, what that would mean to you. Um, what is that, when you remind yourself to do that, how would I know you're allowing those that you're with to lead you, lead the experience with a sense of curiosity? What does that sound and look like? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, I think part of that relates to the fact that, you know, everyone has their own individual passions and curiosities about nature. And you don't always know if somebody is, like, totally stoked on tracking or bird language or plants or, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, I'm kind of in the, the mind where I think that nature has benefits for everyone and that everyone can really benefit from getting some, some sensory engagement with the natural world and um, that people are in, in different places on that journey. And so someone who's sort of coming from, uh, a, you know, a, a maybe a less attuned mindset, maybe they haven't spent that much time in nature and they're not quite as clear about why they would even want to do that, you're, you're probably going to want to approach it a little bit differently than someone who is right there with you, um, ready to, to just, you know, they just want to know everything there is to know. And so I think for me a lot of it is just about um, rather than, you know, coming into an outside experience with a particular agenda about what you really want them to get out of the experience, just being open to um, the experience that they're having right now and um, just looking for ways to sort of enhance that. And um, okay. so, you know, if, it could be as simple as um, just, just being there with them and, and waiting for them to show some sort of interest in something. And um, so, yeah, I think we'll talk more about that. But is that kind of getting at your question there? I think that gets the, yeah, that greases the skids. So that leads to um, a second one. And then if, if you want to jump in, you can do that. Um, we'll go back and forth. So um, I've often heard you say inviting them to go deeper, you know, noticing where, so observing and listening, where are the people you're with? Where are their senses taking them? What are their senses being drawn to? And then inviting them to go deeper. What would that look like? What would that sound like if I was observing you um, assisting them to go deeper? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, like what, what I will often do is when I'm outside with other people, um, this is great, by the way, because I don't, I don't often actually – think about it from that other level removed, but I, mm -hmm. I will actually, um, I will look at, at the person and, mm -hmm. and have my ears sort of open to what's happening around me, and I'm mm -hmm. watching for, um, like you can almost tell if you look at a person by looking at their, their eyes, the way that their eyes are moving around and where, where their sort of gaze is focusing and how long it's staying in one place. Is it sort of moving all over the place? Are they, are they really scattered in their, in their focus or are they actually tuning in with something? You can, you can sort of tell when they're inside their head versus when they're outside looking at the world. And um, so what I typically will start with is just looking at, okay, where is this person's gaze going where where is it resting and mm -hmm. um you know i'll see their eyes looking at um a, a plant on the ground and um so i might i might ask them you know about that plant like um mm -hmm. you know is it, are you interested in plants it could be a, something as simple as that and yeah. um and and they'll tell they'll tell me like uh you know through conversation, what it is that they're they're interested in, they're interested about, mm -hmm. and and maybe it's even something different. Maybe they're like, I, I was just noticing that that insect on the plant, and so it's not even the plant that they're looking at; it's it's the insect. And yeah. um, 
yeah, I think it's just uh, using using my senses to look at the person and then finding out where they are actually focused and then engaging them in a conversation about that aspect of nature. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I would say that that's, that's kind of one of the main processes that I use. Good. <clears throat> yeah, so some of the research that, that I've been doing, um, a, 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 two phrases emerge from this, this piece of conversation we're on, uh, and those are lantern consciousness and spotlight consciousness. So if there's, if, if the person and often very young children are, are fall into what would be called the lantern consciousness. So they walk with you and what are they paying t- attention to? They're paying attention to a lot, odor, temperature, humidity, um, amount of light. Sounds. Uh, they they're really looking through a very wide, wide, wide lens, and it isn't just visual; it's a sensual lens. Um, when one compares that to what occurs as we grow older in traditional education, we're often pointed to a specific name, species, place whatever okay what's this rock what type of soil is this how many legs does this creature have you know so as as as, a, as someone grows there's a there's a remarkable magnification of the amount of spotlight consciousness we bring to, to places so uh, for for many adults that they'll walk into a woods and they'll walk into a nature immersion doing a lot of that um, so honestly, what I sometimes do consciously, intentionally, is pay attention. Do I have people that are younger, and are they in fact coming in with that lantern consciousness? Um, are, are they later adolescents or older, and are they in fact kind of coming in with that spotlight curiosity? And by the way, there's no good or bad here. They're just very different. And then sometimes I'll tweak them. I'll, I'll consciously reverse them. So when a child is coming with the macro, we may, we may, and they may help me find something very micro. So we were doing a really fun nature play um, program at one of the area libraries, and it was outdoors the whole time. We weren't inside at all. And one of the little children was walking along with their mom, and the little child noticed a patch of light green under the dark green leaf. Now, the child noticed it because the leaf was above them on the plant. Adults would not have seen this little patch of light green because they were coming in from an upper view, but the child looking from underneath. And what it was is a cluster of insect eggs, insect eggs. So it was a really neat discovery that we could talk about. Um, and we were actually on a scavenger hunt at that point. So that was something that the child and the mom brought back to the little blanket that we lay out to talk about. Well, well what did you discover, you know? Um, so, and, and then sometimes with, with an adult who's paying so much attention, sometimes I'll go out on nature preserves with some of their staff. And, and they're really dedicated professionals. They really are. And, 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 and they need to feel a need to name it. And they, they get really... Um, conscientious about their ability to name and know stuff. Uh, and yet, what I notice is sometimes they're on a walk with very young children, so it, it may not be a great fit when the children are kind of all over the place and listening and touching and smelling, but the adult feels they have to teach the kid, all right, here's the difference between poison ivy and poison oak. And Here's the difference between an insect and a spider, you know. Um, so, again, neither are bad. They're just different. And it is really valuable to be attentive to what level of awareness is the child or the adult bringing to the experience and then starting there and building from there. So, yeah, I like your approach, too, with that, I think. 
they're, they're kind of similar things. So, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So without me prodding you for a question, please feel free to share something that you felt you wanted to touch on, and and we'll just kind of give it over to you for a little bit. Yeah, well, um, I actually do have a question that I was curious to ask you about, and it's sort of related to a time where, um, you know, let's say let's say you're outside and you're you're actually doing this, you're observing people and the the people that you're with, and you're looking for these signs that they're they're interested in nature, that they're aware of nature, and what happens if you notice that somebody is just really not not engaged and they're mm-hmm. sort of um, not really jumping in fully into nature? What do you do in that situation? Wow, what a great and difficult question. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to hopefully at least provide a little provocative um, uh, experience here. So bored. So as a, as a teacher for 34 years, yeah, lots of times kids would come to me and they were bored for lots of reasons that they would come in or during the period they would get bored. So let's take that segue out to nature and you've got a small group and some are loving it and they're crazy and they're having a great time. And this could be true of adults, if you've got a small group of adults. And yet you know from your wisdom of being with people that Tom over there or Sally over there are just not having much of a good time. There's something else either going on or it's just not hitting their level of interest. So what I might try to do is say, hey, let's pause for a minute and let's everybody get a buddy. Does everybody find a buddy? And this works really well with older folks, too. So let's take a moment and everyone, let's do a little activity where everybody partners with somebody else and just introduces themselves. Um, And now let's turn to that person and for the next three minutes, and I'll keep an eye on time, let's invite one of you to be the one that is talking and sharing what you're seeing and feeling and experiencing. But please, only one of you, and let the other one be the active listener, okay? So that will go on for about a three-minute period, and sometimes there's not a lot of talking, and sometimes there's more talking. But now they're in diets. Now they're knowing that someone there is paying attention to them, and they can't just get lost in, in, in the small group because someone's either talking to them or they're supposed to be talking to their partner. Um, and of course, then we switch it up. Three minutes later, okay, let's reverse this and let the uh, person who was talking be the listener and uh, be generous about that willingness to listen. And they, what do you hear? What, what, what do you notice? Your, your partner is noticing. And then you do the debrief. You find a neat place that's comfortable and elegant and easy to be in. If you can sit, you sit if there's a log or someplace, you sit on a log. If there's a bench nearby, maybe you use that or just a shady area under a tree. And, and you debrief it. Hey, so those are, when you were listening, what were some cool things that the people, you know, said or felt? And then when you were talking, what were some of the cool things that you were discovering? So what is this doing? This is... Giving people who are bored, children or adults, the safety net of a really small relationship, one other person. And often that catalyzes them to come out of their sense of boredom, even if it's for a brief period of time, because they have been called in some way to be diligent to this other human being that they're with. And they kind of know Three minutes here, three minutes there. I could do anything for, you know, six minutes or whatever. So it it temporarily amplifies and catalyzes some synergy between two people. So that's a tool or a technique that I've used sometimes, and I find it pretty exciting and very unexpected. You really don't know what you're going to get. So it's very much in this whole line of go with their curiosity. So, yeah. So that's yeah. my, my response, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like that. And and it sort of it makes me think about just how much of the um experience of, of connecting with nature and mentoring people with nature. It's like a big part of it is nature, but then there's also a very human side of it. Like I think anytime we're we're really wanting to do um nature education in a way that impacts people on a deeper level, it's not just about uh, facts and information and being like really scientific about it it's also like this emotional element to it and some people just they have an easier time connecting when they can do it with other people and so I really like how you sort of use that principle um, of putting them in pairs and um, you know you as a as a mentor you can even do that um, yourself, like you can be the person who goes there and, and, you know, just if you notice someone is not really engaged, um, just talking to them and, and, you know, start sharing what you're noticing and seeing if they get excited about anything. And, and that can be a really good way to approach it by sort of melding the, the human aspect and the, and the natural aspect. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Good, good, good. So um, I think one of the things to ascertain when you want students or the people you're with to observe in a rich dimension so that they might grow, I think it's really helpful as the guide, mentor, <clears throat> um, to have a sense if you don't already know, or even if you think you know, ask the group quite early why they came, why, do, why are they here? And let everyone know that everyone can have a remarkably unique, different answer. But checking in and asking them, why are they here? What do they maybe hope to get from this? Can really make the experience very rich because right away, they feel they count. Right away, they feel like they're driving this because you paused enough to ask, you cared enough, you were skillful enough to ask them, why did they come? Um, and uh, I think lots of times we just get kind of concerned that it's got to go well and, oh, I've, I've got two hours or one hour or the weather's kind of questionable and I better boom, boom, boom. You know, we got our drama that goes on. And I think... Um, if we want them to grow, and of course, in the ideal world, we always want them to grow, um, coming, asking them, why, why, they, why are you here today? I'm here because my teacher made me get on the bus. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Pretty shallow answer, but maybe that's all it is for that kid. Um, and meanwhile, some others may say some interesting things. Have you ever had that experience of, hearing from someone quite early, um, Brian, or um, checking in why they came? Do you have any recollection of that yeah. ever occurring? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, and, and especially where most of, most of my focus is with, with adults, like I love mm -hmm. asking the question of, you know, what are your goals? You know, what would you yeah. like to actually uh, get yeah. out of this experience? And, um, you know, if I can find that they have a particular skill that's sort of at the core of what they really want to go deep with, maybe it's tracking yeah. or maybe it's yeah. bird identification or something, then I can yeah. I can focus more of my energy on on that. And my my eventual goal is to be able to take that core passion that they have and expand it out so that they they yeah. get connected to all areas of nature and they're not just yeah a tracker, but they also know the plants and they also know the birds and all that kind of stuff. But I think if you start with what they're, what they're really passionate about, what there's a lot of energy for, and develop that really deeply, um, it, it gives you an opportunity to then start spreading that passion into other areas of the natural world. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think a huge amount of the observation that you can do of people in nature, part of it is there's like these different levels of observation. You can observe people 
on the sensory level and just literally what are you observing in their body language and their nonverbal communication. But then there's also like the, the level of linguistics where um, mm -hmm. you can just talk to them and, and pay attention to their, to their language and the kind of words that they use, the things that they talk about, the stories that they tell. Um, I'm doing a, a, a group right now, this mentoring group that I do, and one of the topics that we had recently was um, looking at uh, language and storytelling and, and basically what happens as, like, as a mentor, um, you can ask a question like what was happening outside. When, when somebody comes to you and they've just had an experience outside, you can ask them about it. And, um, you know, contrasting the difference between how some people will just give you a, a incredible detail and, and they have all these stories and, and things that they're sharing and that they're excited about and they'll go on and on and on and be really engaged in a conversation whereas other people will, will come back from that exact same experience and they'll say, well, uh, you know, nothing was happening out there. I didn't really, I didn't really see any birds. I didn't really see any plants. And it, it, the, you don't even have to be outside with them to tell that the first person is much more engaged. And so yeah. um, that's, that's another kind of, of observation. And, and yeah, I, I think questions are a really great way to do it because um, – you know, anytime that you say something to another person, whether you tell them a story or you ask them a question, their response to that is going to give you a lot of information about what's happening inside their mind and, and how they're feeling about the topic and, um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I definitely love that as a strategy. Yeah. So let's t touch on something that we all hold no matter how much time we spend in nature, we, we all, and, and, and I guess that the more time you spend in nature, the more you uncover what these are for you as an individual. But let's talk about fears of nature, fears in nature, uh, aspects of nature that bring up some fear for you. And, and, and I think what I'm witnessing more and more in these more recent generations of people is because of the lack of exposure, the lack of contact time in the natural world, there, there, is a, there is a, and this is not anything I'm particularly, um, I mean, it's a real challenge. There's a lot more people who are growing more and more fearful of spending time in, in, in nature in a natural setting. So, you know, afraid to touch, afraid to get too near, Afraid even to observe from a distance because they just freak. Um, mm -hmm. Some of this is, is fostered at a really remarkably young age, just as an, a kind of a probably an everyday example for a lot of people. Um, you know, you're in a home and you, someone who, who's a significant other in your life, maybe a mom, a dad, a great an aunt, an uncle, an older brother, um, sees a spider or sees an ant or sees a bee and the instantaneous reaction is to kill it so that the person witnesses the killing of the organism. And, 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 and that's really powerful because it wasn't anything you expected. All of a sudden, out of the blue, this event happens, you know, um, and then the kid takes away, whoa, <laughs> I guess that's how I'm supposed to behave <laughs> when these things happen. Now, right. there are many other times where that isn't the, the scenario. For example, my... My daughter, Saria, recently was indoors and um, saw, a, you know, a, a bee um, inside and said, Papa, do you have a cup? So Papa, me, got her a cup. And she skillfully, obviously, had done this before. She took the cup, covered the bee, slid an index card underneath it, walked outside very naturally, released the, the, the bee and said, bye, bee. And that was it. No big drama. No big anything. So for one child, there's no fear. Um, for another person, it could be remarkable fear. Um, so I guess in your world of being in nature a lot, I think of many of the people that are listening to this, you may be one of the people that's in nature quantitatively uh, highest. What, 
what do you observe about fears that people have in nature? Perhaps share a fear of your own that you might have or had and worked with. And then, you know, how might we address the fear of nature thing? Yeah. Um, well, that's that's an amazing question. I mean, I, and I think um, I also even want to expand it from from just looking at fear and also talking about comfort in general because I think mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know one of the mm-hmm. things that fear is sort of a, an acute thing that that tends to happen when there's like um, you know a bee encounter or like a, a bear encounter or something like that. Mm-hmm. But then there's mm-hmm. also like an overall level of anxiety that I think a lot of people have about just being in the woods, um, things yeah. like being away from their cell phone, away from the internet, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, and just, you know, being able to feel at home when you're out um, camping and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think it, it, it speaks very directly to something else that I was hoping would come up through this conversation, which is, not only, like we've been talking a lot today about observing people in the moment and kind of that moment where you're outside with them and you're having an experience with them. But I think that one of the other aspects of observation is actually looking at how people change in their overall um, energy, body language, expression over a period of time. Like I think my ideal thing when I'm working with people is not to have just a a one-off experience with them where I take them outside for a day and we hang out, we have a good time, do some tracking, and then it's sort of done. They go back to their lives. I really like um, working with people over an extended period of time and seeing how with repetition and, uh, you know, routines, like going to your sit spot every day and sharing the stories and, uh, you know, exploring the different skills over a period of time, it, it really does change people on on a deeper level and a much more permanent level. And so um, I think, you know, I recently had an experience where I, I was out um, with some people um, deep in the forest and um, we were, you know, just having a couple days in the, out in the wild. And um, the thing that, that really stood out to me and, and I was just like really – surprised by it there was there was a cabin there and um you know our intention was to be there and 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 be connected to nature through that time and they spent almost the entire time like inside the cabin (laughs) and i i was like what's going on here why why are we why aren't we not outside like we should be around the fire right now and all that kind of stuff and i there, there were a lot of mosquitoes at this place, mm. and okay. um, yeah. it, it just it made me reflect about how the the time that I have spent. There is a point to where I'm going. It's a very rambly story, but um, the time that I have spent out in the woods, um, I've I used to just hate mosquitoes, and and I couldn't stand being around them, and you know just like being around bugs and stuff. It uh, just I would much rather be inside and and I think that there's some sort of change that has happened where I'm actually I love nature more than I hate mosquitoes and um so just sort of that overall um becoming more comfortable with being around insects like that and and um you know it's it's not that they don't still somewhat bother me a little bit but I've just yeah. gotten more used to them being there and so okay. that's sort of one of the things that I think you can look for o- over an extended period of time that as yeah. people have repeated experiences where they sort of push those edges um, yeah. you know they're starting to become uh, they're exposing themselves and this is one of the reasons why sit spot is such a, a powerful routine because you're you're having a daily process where you're exposing yourself to the edges of your comfort and you're exposing mm-hmm. yourself to your fears. And um, as you sit there for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes every day, gradually over a period of, of months, those fears start to actually go away. 
and it it shows up in in terms of just people being much more comfortable um, yeah. around things that in the past would have made them very uncomfortable and unable to just be present with what's happening around them. Um, and I can I can sit you know amongst insects and um, feel you know totally tuned in still with with the birds and and what's going on and it doesn't distract me like it used to. And so I think. Um, yeah, I think that's another sort of thing. It's kind of how repeated exposure, um, it will change the way that you relate to things that maybe have a little bit of discomfort or anxiety or fear. Yeah, so that touches on <clears throat> really what really nice, nice magnification of the initial question. You took it from a very specific question on my part, you know, a specific fear, to the overall ambient anxiety that someone might have just being in nature. <clears throat> um, so to, to, to demonstrate the why underneath that, we, we know uh, today uh, that repeated episodes, and, and you have to have the repeated episodes because going back to a topic you probably hear from me once every time we talk, neuroplasticity. Every time you get out there among more bugs, different kinds of bugs, um, your body and your brain becomes slowly rewired and be, is literally able to tolerate and gain a, a different neurochemical pathway. And that only happens, that emergence to a, to a new level of comfort or at least tolerance literally can only happen by repeated episodes of, of it. So, um, yeah, and in fact, a, a, a natural immune system is, is evident to that. So they, they say, oh, my gosh, my little kid's got another cold, another cold, another cold. And those people with a little bit more medical background would say, oh, good. And, and what do you mean, oh, good? My kid's got another cold. Well, your kid's gaining an immunological ability to withstand more and more viral infections every time they get a virus. So and that only happens because of the repeated episodes. So um, uh, repetition of something, including an, an ambient fear of being in nature, being out there, even in small little episodes of it, will absolutely foster more comfort um, in nature. Um, yeah. 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 Good. Good. Exciting stuff. Um, yeah. So, I, I threw out the last question or two. Is there something that that, that you want to uh, touch on, uh, uh, or or not? Well, I I just uh, I w I'm really glad that you brought in the the neuroplasticity element to it mm -hmm. and that explanation because I think that really tied a, a really nice bow on on exactly what I was trying to convey through my story there and um, you know it's just for me it's so much about this is is that you know nature really does it makes us stronger as people it makes us healthier as people it makes us smarter as people um, you know it makes our brains and bodies work better and um, you know I just think that uh, any any tool that we can have to uh, help us do that even better is going to be a really valuable thing. And so, um, yeah, I just really appreciate you uh, bringing that that uh, neuroplasticity word back into the conversation because, uh, yeah, that was really good. So one of the things that I want to make sure that I get said before we wrap up today is it would be really fun, and we've had it happen once or twice or three or four times, if anyone listening to this <clears throat> could could reach out to both of us with their story related to the podcast they listen to, there is something of significance to them, because that only makes Brian and I wiser and adds to the richness of the conversation. Um, so always welcoming um, feedback and th th probably the easiest way to get in touch with with me would be to visit um, a website that I created about a year ago, you know, Creative Nature Play. Um, 
because there you can, you know, contact me. And, and I, I really find that that aspect of this podcast thing and the mentoring thing, the richest and most satisfying part for me is that dialogue that then emerges among the people that we can't see <laughs> right now live that, um, that may be listening to what we're doing. Um, so uh, the other piece I want to say in relationship to that is if anyone listening has a topic uh, that they're curious about or something that they really want to share, please don't hesitate to let Brian or I know about something you'd like to hear soon in the podcast series um, because we are highly curious folks and we would love to develop a theme for a podcast based on something you all find to be significant or of merit that you're curious about. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I just, I've been really enjoying connecting with um, the few people who have, uh, who have written in and um, just, uh, yeah, it really does add another element. And so, yeah, you can find me at, at naturementor.com. And if you go to my about page, um, you, there's a little bit more of my story. And down at the bottom, there's a comment thing. And so you can, yeah. um, you can submit the form there and, uh, and yeah. get in touch with me. I mean, I'd love to, you know, if you're listening to this episode and you are actually working on applying nature-based mentoring or education programs and you're, you're wanting to actually use observation of your students as a core part of your process. You know, I'd, I'd love to just hear what you're working on and, and we can talk a little bit more about um, how the things that Dave and I have been talking about today, how do they actually apply to your specific situation? Because I think that that's, that's going to be one of the, I mean, that is going to be the, the, the transformational thing about these podcasts is when you actually take the things that we're talking about and apply them in your life, in your schools, in your families. And so, um, yeah, definitely feel free to, to um, we, we, both Dave and I would love to hear from you. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling like we covered a lot today. Is there something that's hanging there that is a piece of fruit you need to harvest before we uh, wind it down today, Brian? Uh, I'm oh, I, leave that. I think that. Yeah. That's uh, that's perfect. I I think um, okay. I feel complete okay. with that. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'm looking forward to another our next conversation for sure. And I do want to thank Jared for reaching out to us. And we've got a nice vibrant relationship going with Jared, one of our listeners, and uh, found out some fascinating things about the work Jared is doing. So, uh, Jared, if you're listening to this one, thanks again for your reach and look forward to staying in relationship with you.